There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel here. It's a beautiful morning. It's already getting hot, though, but it's 28 degrees at 7 a.m. I'm feeling hot just walking here, about three blocks, four blocks, because I had to lug a lot of big, heavy books because I got lots to tell you. I am stimulated up to my nipples because I woke up. I didn't set the alarm because I thought I either need my sleep or I need to wake up naturally to watch this Zoom chat from the Montana Book Festival. It's not available after the event, so I'm glad I woke up and watched it. And it was with two indigenous writers from north of the border, Alicia Elliott, who is a multimedia, very drama queenish cultural presence, and her book of essays, A Mind Spread Out on the Ground, has just been issued in the States, and I have not yet read it. She is a piece of work. I am grappling with her, and that's probably why I wanted to watch the event, because I've never seen her on a video or anything, just her Twitter is wow. Um, but she is an important voice about indigenous stuff across North America. But the other panelist from the unceded indigenous territory that is now Vancouver is a two-spirited writer. Oh, I keep pulling out the wrong book. Billy Ray Belcourt, and I have one of his books of poetry, Indian Coping Mechanisms, Notes from the Field, that I haven't read, and because I was so stimulated by him, and I now have such a crush on Billy Ray Belcourt, just find anything where he's speaking or reading his poetry on YouTube, and I think you will want to join me in my crush. He has got the most beautifully articulate, soft-spoken gay voice, and he's beautiful and young. And more importantly, his mind is a thing of beauty. So I'm gonna start this this week, even though I don't have any room for it in my reading life, but I'm gonna make room for it. What I loved about him, in particular, was the way, and what he read, I think it's from his memoir, that is more recent, which I may have already purchased, because I've been buying so many books, so I'll, I'll come across it or I'll buy it, because I, I, I want to consume everything that he's ever written now. Oh, better check. Yes, his pronoun is he, he and him. What I loved about what he read was that he was injecting critical theorists into his, I think what he read was prose. It's hard to tell because he read it and it sounded so poetic. I don't know if it's poetry or prose. And maybe that doesn't matter. That's the point. I think one of the many points he was trying to make. He injected critical theorists like Judith Butler and Foucault and those types that were the bane of my existence in grad school into his writing in a way that gave me a visceral hold of them and showed the work that he has done that I never was able to do to make it visceral. Ha! Huh. I love him. So here is... A short poem of his called Indian Homo Sonnet in which Maggie Nelson makes an appearance and I struggled with her book because she just copied and pasted all the critical theory she'd ever read and didn't write very much of her own stuff. What she wrote I loved. The one about her partner going through gender reassignment surgery at the same time that she was pregnant. Whatever that book is, you know what it is. It's her most famous book and I really struggled with it. So here she is in this poem, Indian Homo Sonnet. An Indian is the ellipsis of a nation. Even in God's palm, a homo is a yearning the size of a world. Is an invisible spectacle a paradox? Is a good melancholia? Mathematically speaking, an Indian homo is a metaphysical conundrum. Put differently, I am a mother before all else. Maggie Nelson speculates that a mother is the archetypal Livinassian subject, which is to say, my lover is two fingers pulling apart the mouth of a planet. He is a dancer. To him, my living is the sound of an emptying. When I die, it will still be autumn in my body. I trust he will dust my shadow off so as to watch it tangle in dusk's wild mane. I was a windswept eye from the start. Now, I don't know what an archetypal Levinassian subject is, so 
those couple lines in it still didn't speak to me deeply, but uh, I just love in this poem, a windswept eye. So that happened. So I, I've been up ever since. I've been on the exercise bike, had a shower, which I don't usually do because you, you ain't smelling me on my Friday reads. And uh, here I am. Got lots to tell you. I finished four books. I have no bales. So let's go directly to what I finished. First of all, I have finished Shiggy Bane. This is probably going to be my book of the year. I loved it in a five-star way. There's actually nothing that I could say that I didn't love about it. It is the shawniest of Sean books. It will probably be my book of the year. And it was such an emotional experience reading it that I, I just am going to cut myself some slack. When I connect on such a deep emotional level with a book, I don't do a good job of reviewing it. So I'm not going to do a full review. Because what would I say? I love the writing. I love the characters. It made me cry finished. When a book touches me this deeply, I'm best not to try to pick it apart, not to pretend that I can explain to you why you should read it. Can't even do much more of a better job than I just did in that inarticulate sentence or two to express why I loved it. Yeah, it's just the best book I've read so far in 2020. I'm aware of the critiques that are out there. Most people love it. It's got a very high rating on Goodreads, and most of the reviews have been superlative. I made a stupid promise that if it wins the Booker this year, I'm going to become a Booker groupie next year. I'm going to read the entire long list and the short list. The short list before the prize is announced. The long list in the fullness of time, and I will honor that promise. So Shuggy Bane is a gay proto-gay, I think he's about not seven years old, six years old, maybe younger when we first meet him. His dad is a macho, asshole, playboy, taxi driver, and his mom is a lovely, vivacious, uh, horrendous alcoholic. And they don't stay together very long, and then it's him living in the home with an alcoholic mother who loves him very dearly, but he and the other members of her family are always playing second fiddle to her addiction. That's all I'm going to say about it, but I just thought the characters were so alive, even in the process of dying, killing themselves. It was just pitch perfect, and I know some people thought it was too long, and all the parts didn't hold together. The only thing, if I had to say uh, uh, one thing that as a flaw, it should have been twice as long. These characters are going to live in me forever. I, I just loved it. I have also finished Miyako Kawakami's Breasts and Eggs. I read most of it during Women in Translation Month, translated from the Japanese by Sam, Bat, and David Boyd. And I really liked it. I didn't love it. I couldn't give it five stars, but I will passionately recommend it as having been a four-star review. I was able to review this. I filmed my review yesterday morning, and it will go up uh, sometime in the next week. Uh, uh, so stay tuned for that. It didn't all hang together, but I was deeply engrossed in it from start to finish. Didn't think as a work that the two halves necessarily fit together and that the second half was not as f literarily profound as the first. So there's the uh, takeaway from my video review. And yeah, I'm so glad I read it. It's powerful and important and you should read it. Yesterday I also finished, I called him Necktie by Milena Michiko Flazar, translated from the German by Sheila Dickey. And this one didn't end up working for me, I'm sorry to say. Um, I didn't hate it, and there were parts of it that I loved, but it was the beginning of it that I loved. It is about a relationship that started in a park much like this in Tokyo, I think Tokyo, certainly Japan, between a hik hikikomori young man who's been living in his bedroom and not even speaking to or seeing his parents in his own house for two or three years, he's about 20, but he does start venturing out to the park and he becomes curious about a salary man, businessman, who's always there. And they sit across from each other and eventually they start speaking. I found their relationship in some ways very moving and certainly that's what it ends up being, a back and forth conversation where the narrative point of view shifts between the men as they tell each other the stories of their lives. And I found a lot of that really moving. But I never bought into the fact that a young man who was that deeply troubled and antisocial and afraid of connection could open up. We see his caution, but it, it's, I wasn't convinced that that could happen. 
the way it did. And Milena Michko Flazar, she's half Japanese, but she was born in Germany, as far as I understand it, and has only spent a little bit of time in Japan. And that really showed, and so that kept pulling me out of the story. Uh, one review that I saw said that the, the, the birds, the young guy, the Hikikomori, Hikikomori is, I'm not going to do a full review of this, Hikikomori is the, uh, this peculiarly Japanese phenomenon of young people just withdrawing from the world and staying in their room or their apartments and not having any human contact forever or for years or until they, you know, something terrible happens. I had forgotten that it was the sound of birds through his window that first drew him to go outside. Yes, a flight of cranes. Uh, page 10, he said, through the gap in the curtains, I could make out a flight of cranes. Well, one reviewer for the Japan Times said, there are no cranes in Japan. There never have been any cranes in Japan. So hello. That didn't bug me because I don't know anything about birds, but what also bugged me, and this is not really a spoiler, because the, the reason, I don't think it's much of a spoiler, that the businessman, the salary man, he is spending all his afternoons in the park because he got fired weeks or months before and he hasn't had the heart to break the news to his wife, so he still dresses and goes off to work and brings his bento box and uh, uh, rice balls to, and sits in the park on a sunny day or goes to a coffee shop if the weather's not any good. And he's fired for incompetence, and he's about my age. I mean, he's not a young man. He's middle-aged. And I just couldn't buy that he would get fired, because in Japan, people don't get fired for incompetence. I mean, of course it happens, but no. The, the, the system is designed to create, perpetuate, and reward incompetence. You just uh, do less and less as you get older and give, get more and more money and uh, get your own office and read the paper all day and that's how the system works. People don't get fired because they don't know how to do their job. There isn't much of a job to do. And again, I am caricaturing Japanese business culture, but that kept pulling me to the story. He wouldn't get fired. He'd get promoted. So, yeah, some of the central premises of it bugged me. So I couldn't enjoy the really nice writing and the moving stories. I also felt there were a couple storylines about their childhoods that they shared with each other that were overly sentimental. Not all of them. For example, I love the story that the husband told, and I'm not going to tell you what the story was, but the husband, the salaryman, told about how he met his wife and how fiery and, and unconventional she was. I love that. And the, there were tragic things that happened to the kid that deeply touched me, but then other stories that I just thought it was overkill and should have been left out. So. It reminded me of the discussion that Electra, my friend Electra and I had along with Cecilia about that Greek novel, the title of which is gone. I will put the cover here for a minute, where Electra kept getting pulled out of the story because certain historical details were not accurate. She had that experience, but Cecilia and I didn't so much because we didn't know the history of Greece during World War II. Well, the things that I know about Japanese culture that that Flossar seemed seems oblivious to or kept pulling me out. So that's interesting. If I didn't know anything about Japan, maybe it would have been a more positive experience. But uh, ultimately, disappointing with some bright spots. And I would read other th things, but I think Milena Michko Flazar should probably write about things closer to home. And I also finished yesterday Ermgard Coyne's debut novel, Gilgi. Is that right? Britta told me how to pronounce it, and I've already forgotten. <laughs> I'm going to go back tomorrow afternoon. Uh, but I, because of your Friday reads, I at least wanted to, <laughs> uh, to help you with the um, that coin. It's Gilgi. So it's a G, a G not not G, but Gilgi. I had been pronouncing it as Gilgi, but it is, thank you, Britta. Gilgi. Gilgi, one of us. And I had forgotten it was her debut, so Britta reminded me that it was her debut because I didn't enjoy it as much as The Artificial Silk Girl, which was a five-star read last year. This was a four-star read, and perhaps that might have even been a little bit generous, but no, there were things about it that I really liked, but the fact that she needed to write this before she could write the masterpiece that is The Artificial Silk Girl, fine. Her writing style is described as what? Impressionistic or 
keep using words I don't know and I'm too lazy to look up. It was an adjective used on Goodreads, one of the reviews, and I thought, yeah, that sounds right. Expressionistic. Um, dot, dot, dot. The ellipses in this started driving me crazy, and I remember them in The Artificial Silk Girl and not bothering me at all. So there was something tightened up that was a little bit loosey-goosey here. Uh, by the way, this is translated by Jeff Wilkes from the German, and it's a different translator. But I thought I like the writing here, so I think the translation is good. But maybe it's the translation, I don't know. Or maybe just that she sharpened her craft. It's about uh, Gilgi, who is a young woman in Cologne in the 1920s, the Weimar era, and she is dealing with being a single woman, looking for love, finding love, dealing with sexual harassment, very modern themes of uh, abortion and sexuality, uh, finding out she's an adoptee and looking for her birth mother. Maybe a little bit too much going on in the novel, but I loved the portrayal of women's working life in Weimar, Germany, and her friendships. But I wasn't as in love with the way her interiority was rendered on the page, and it got a little tiresome by the end. So not a complete success, but I would recommend but you just have to promise me that if you start with this, that whether you like it or you don't, you will go on to her masterpiece, The Artificial Silk Girl, because that, you will be in for a real treat when you get to that one. Ah, that's what I've read. I've had a pretty darn good reading week. And I've started the two that I told you I would. So I have started Akweke Emeze's newest novel, The Death of Vivek Oji. I'm 20, 30 pages in. Really liking it. Uh, the story's just getting started. It's a family story. It starts with Vivek Oji's parents and how they meet. And it's like Emezi's own story and like the marriage that was, at the, that was a big part of the story of Freshwater. It's a mixed race marriage. Indo-African mother and Nigerian uh, father. Hey, well, uh, during the editing I realized I completely fucked up with Akweke Emezi's pronouns, so let me restate this appropriately. I just think Emeze is one of the most incredible writers, will probably be remembered, will probably become one of the preeminent writers of the first half of the 21st century. I absolutely love the way they can convey elemental African world international literary energies through their pen or their word processor onto the page. I am just in love with their use of language. So it's starting out good. This is a buddy read with Lindsay of it's Lindsay's Book Life. We haven't checked in yet. We're going to start checking in once a week on Mondays. So I will have six chapters read by then. I think I've read maybe three now. It's starting out really great. And I've just got a bare start on the new Heidi James novel from Ireland, The Sound Mirror. So I can't say much about it. I'm just getting a sense of what the story is. And it's told in at least three voices so far, which I believe is a grandmother, mother, and daughter. And I believe it's the daughter who's on her way to murder her mother. But it's not a thriller. It's described as a very literary novel. And... I'm just getting a bare sense. I, I'm certainly in, engaged in it. I've read 20 pages, and I can't tell you much more than that. It's definitely holding my interest, and I don't know yet what the title's all about. But more on this later. So that's what I have started. In terms of the f coming week, I was only planning to be starting one, but now because I have determined that I'm going to start this as well, and this is poetry, so I can fit this in and around the edges with no problem. Billy Ray... Belcourt's Indian Coping Mechanisms, but I am going to start, it's not exactly a buddy read, uh, but it's for a Zoom video discussion that Dan of the Weird Book Book Club and I will be doing in about a month on Fernanda Meltor's Hurricane Season, translated from the Spanish by Sophie Hughes, who is one of the most talented translators working today, and this is, what's the violent version of Marmite book. This is a Marmite book. <laughs> Psycho killer Marmite book. It's very violent. And I am not sure that I will be able to hack it. But every other review I hear makes me expect that I'm going to bail or I'm going to love it. So it's going to be either or. And uh, stay tuned. <laughs> but <sighs> I watched a panel with her six months ago. And I loved her. And the way that she talked about the violence made me think 
oh, I think it'll be okay, I think it'll be okay, but then I've heard other people have just really struggled. My tolerance level for gratuitous violence, for violence that is not integral to the story, um, like I can read Holocaust stuff and it, it's very upsetting, but I know how important it is that I experience all that to understand what happened or understand the characters in the novel, no problem. But when it doesn't have any reason, I just absent myself from the from the reading. Um, what was the name of the one by the Polish writer? I always forget. Anyway, I'll talk about that on my Zoom video with Dan. Speaking of Zooming with Dan, Dan and Michael Kitto, I think his channel is his own name, Michael Kitto. He's got the translation podcast. And... Uh, the red-headed guy from the Amer the southern states, <laughs> who I haven't gotten into his channel, be just time, I haven't had time, but uh, I now that I've seen more of him in this Zoom chat, the three of them talking about weird literature, two-hour video, you, the time will fly by. I'm only half through, and I'm really enjoying it. Oh, sorry, Michael Kitto's channel is Knowledge Lost, and Read the World is the red-headed guy's channel. <laughs> What is his name? He's on Twitter. I follow him on Twitter. And he is big into translated lit, too. And now that I've seen mo half of this video, I will definitely be checking out his channel more. I'm sorry, I'll put it in, because uh, I'm not finding it. I hate to be talking about a booktuber by describing his appearance. He's a redhead, and he, I know he lives in the American South, and his name has gone out of my head. But that chat is great. Let me close with this. I just posted my review last night of Rebecca Brown's The Gifts of the Body. You can check that out if you want. Love this book. And when I was preparing to film the review, which was like six weeks ago, and Googling Rebecca Brown, she's a lesbian writer, I believe, of Australian, born in Australia, lived, lives in the States. But her Wikipedia page said she just died like the month before. So it's that she died in June. It's like, ah! And so I told Greg, because Greg is the one who recommended this book, and we were both sad, and we couldn't find much else, just that it was on Wikipedia. And so I mentioned her recent passing in my review video, and then I, when I was editing the video last night, I went back to check when she had died. So I put the little text thing in my review about her, the date of her death, and uh, her Wikipedia page has been changed. She is no longer dead. <laughs> And in the comment section, you can look at the comment section on a Wikipedia page. So the editor said uh, it was a different Rebecca Brown. <laughs> so thankfully, Rebecca Brown, apparently, if you can trust Wikipedia, and I hope in this case you can, Rebecca Brown is still with us. Thank God, because what a beautiful writer she is. And if anybody knows anything more about her, she doesn't have much of an online presence. I want to read more by her and if you have any recommendations or whatever but uh, I'm ha happy to tell you that if you happen to check her Wikipedia page six weeks ago and were like myself very upset that she had passed on she is back among the living isn't that the best news you've heard all day that's it thank you for watching and have a great day